Hey you guys, Caitlin Albritton of Caitlin Albritton Jewelry here today to talk about hands down my favorite technique, pillow inlay, also referred to as cobblestone inlay. I use this all the time in my figurative jewelry pieces and to me I actually love it way more than flush cut inlay because of that bubbly kind of curvaceous texture on the surface but also because you can combine so many different hardnesses of stones all in this technique that you can't do with flush cut inlay or else you know you have one stone cutting faster than the other and you get the wavy surface not cool um but anyways you guys know the drill all the uh, materials tools all that good stuff as well as link to my own website so you can see more of my work is going to be in the description below so hear me out You'd likely spend as much as this piece of equipment, the Cab King, on uh, a week-long workshop learning this technique, and I'm offering it here for free. If you haven't noticed, I do spend a lot of time editing out all the boring crap and like ruthlessly jam-packing it with all the important stuff. Um, if you, I would like so appreciate it if you wouldn't mind using the link in my description below to send me a little donation to help support the creation of these lapidary and silversmithing tutorials because there's really nothing like it out there right now. And I also want to give a shout out to Jill for her recent donation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it because all this will go towards my video fund. I currently have a gooseneck uh, video camera holder. It holds my phone. This one's different. And it, as I'm like working, it'll slowly start to sag. And so it's given up. I'd like to get a new one of those. And it'll also go towards my one-year-old snack fund. He has a bottomless pit stomach and he loves Sammy jammies. They're like little granola bars and he eats the crap out of them. So <laughs> it'll all go to also go towards that. Um, <laughs> heck, even I'd like cheer for like five bucks. That would be awesome. <laughs> now, a lot of the silversmithing portion is pretty similar to the flush cut inlay that I did. And actually, I think that square or even rectangular framework is going to be a lot easier because you just have the straight cuts to do versus this curved. But I wanted to include this in case you want to include more curvature, curve curvaceous forms in your inlays. Um, but feel free to skip around in the tutorial if you want to get to the, the good part faster, <laughs> the rock cutting. And uh, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> so I'm starting out with a ring that I made out of 14 gauge sterling silver square wire. It's been sitting on my bench for over a year, so I figured I'd use this. But you definitely have a lot of options with what wire thickness, height, and shape you want to use. Like triangle wire would look awesome too. But like I said, a simple rectangle will be much easier to cut the stones for. And then before we solder this to a back plate, I definitely need to flatten it. It's a little wonky, so I'm using my weighted rawhide hammer here. And then I'll file the bottom down so it'll solder nicely to my back plate. Here I'm cutting out a little chunk of 20 gauge back plate so the solder will flow faster than if we try to solder it onto that whole plate. Off camera, I stamp my brand and sterling hallmark. So I'm using a wooden dowel and hammer to flatten that raised surface down so it won't get in the way when I go to inlay layer. You definitely wanna do that if you do any stamping on your piece too. Then I can go ahead and solder my back plate on using hard solder and my homemade Prips Flux. Because I use a 20 gauge back plate, I can just cut off the excess with my shears. Then I file everything flush before cleaning up those edges with my 3M wheel. Now I'll add my jump ring for the bail to attach to. So my phone didn't video soldering the bail, but I definitely took the easy way out and used a pre-made bail from Halstead Bead. Now before I throw this pendant in my tumbler with my stainless steel shot, I'm gonna go clean up the edges and the jump ring with my gray silicone wheel. And then the tumbler is gonna help work hard in the piece while cleaning up the surface to a nice kind of even surface all around. Once it's out of the tumbler, we'll make a template of this shape. Now you could press the piece right in the ink, but I find that using my finger works a lot better. It gets more consistent stamping because you get consistent ink all the way around. Now I recommend doing at least three stamps to have a backup in case your stone splits, like you'll see mine did here in this tutorial. Then you can draw whatever design you want to do, but it's going to be much easier to match straight lines to straight lines. So we'll do a design with three stones just like this. And it would have been easier to add rubber cement to my paper template before cutting it into a million little pieces, but I got too excited. <laughs> but you get the idea. You want to paint a thin layer of rubber cement on both your template and your slabs. And remember that the side that you're going to be gluing the paper template to is going to be the bottom of your inlay tucked away in the silver. So definitely make sure that whatever patterning you want is on the opposite side of your template. To make sure these templates last through all the water and cutting and whatnot, 
I'm gonna be rubbing a thin layer of Gorilla Glue over my template here. When deciding which piece to cut first, I find it easier to kind of start on one side and then move to the other. So I'm gonna be starting with the top piece, which is this plume agate. I'm working on removing all that material until I start to get to the black ink of my paper template on the rounded portion. Now I like to actually keep excess material on the straight side or whatever side that's going to be touching the other stone because if I need to cut off more of the rounded part, it gives you a little extra wiggle room to keep the shape that the size that you want it to be. Same as with the flush cut inlay, I'm cutting my stones a slight taper inward at the bottom to help with a better fit. Plus, if you overcut your sides, you, you can just shave some of that bottom off and it'll help reduce the overcutting. This might be a bit of an excruciating process for some of you since you'll have to keep testing out that stone by holding it up to your silver pendant as you cut because you want to match that inner circle that you're trying to tuck the stone into. Once that stone is starting to fit in my silver, I'll take note and see where my gaps are and what edges are still touching the silver. But the key here is to make sure that both the silver piece and the stone is completely dry so you can see where your gaps are. I will tell you that the water will hide them really, really well and it's gonna piss you off if you overcut. I, I promise you, it will. Now, those edges of the stones that are touching are what needs to be cut down in order for the stone to, one, sit further down in my inlay and two, eliminate those other gaps that you see there. So what I do is use a pencil to mark those sections that are touching so I know what sections need to be cut. I'll keep repeating that process of seeing what is touching until the stone is resting in the very bottom of my design and doesn't have any huge gaps around that half circle edge there. If you do happen to have a gap still, try making a small bevel at that bottom edge to make room for any of that extra solder that might be in those corners and see if that helps make the stone sit more snugly against the walls. At some point during the cutting and fitting, I do end up taking off my template because I find it a little bit distracting since looking at what's in front of you is going to be more useful than trying to go by the paper template alone. Once you're happy with that, I'll draw along that edge where the stone is exposed from the silver to help me see if the stone is sitting evenly in the silver framework. And here you can see it's nice and straight across, so I'm ready to move along in my process here. I should note now, since I forgot to mention it earlier, that while the outer edges, so here that's that half circle, are cut at that small taper inwards, the edge that's touching the next stone is going to be cut straight. But now I'm ready to start doming this piece for the pillow inlay. I'll use that line I just drew, the pencil line, basically as a girdle line that you might draw when you're making regular cabochons. I'm going to start cutting at a 45 degree angle all the way to just above that pencil line. Because there wasn't anything to mark a girdle line for that inner straight line, just I'm just eyeballing it, but you could use a ruler to match the other lines easily. Now eventually you will want to polish away that pencil line, but I like to do it at the 280 resin stage so I don't overcut, but we'll get to that a little later on. Um, so I'm just going to do a bit of doming on this 220 diamond so that the next stone will have enough room when I start to cut it. Plus it'll give you an idea if things are looking good or if you don't like the stone choices after all. But before I move on to the next cutting wheel, I'll actually cut all of my stones first. Now this little band of Amazonite in quartz was supposed to be the center stone of this pillow inlay, but it ended up splitting. And if this happens to you, you can always carefully peel off that template and then re-glue it to another stone. And I'll do both the rubber cement and the CA glue topper again. But I'm actually going to just skip doing this stone altogether and just change up my design a little bit. Now with this other piece of Amazonite, I'm going to start by refining that half circle shape up to the paper template lines on the bottom while also making sure it fits snugly against that plume agate there. So pretty much the same kind of idea as when we cut the plume agate. The last stone in your designs is always going to be the longest to cut because you're going to have to keep double checking your cuts more frequently because you don't have that same wiggle room you used to have um, with your other stone. Like you could change up your design very easily. So once again, using that pencil trick often to see how deep and evenly the Amazonite is sitting. Then keeping making small adjustments based off of what I see and where my gaps are. Now, I usually find it easier to first get the curved parts cut and then the straight edges are easy to do at the end without risking overcutting. Here, I'll hold my Amazonite just inside on one edge so I can see how much is overhanging the silver on the other side. Everything's very dry so I can see very clearly what I need to cut, but we're getting very close to having the stone sit inside this inlay here. 
here's another little close-up of where I'm making that pencil line and everything on the left side of that is where that gap is and everything on the right is what I need to cut that's touching and then it'll fit nice and snug. Now I don't think I filmed it here or did it here but if you're having trouble figuring out um, if the stone is sitting deep enough you could always take out the first stone or first two stones or however many are in it so here I would take out the plume agate and then work on making sure the amazonite is sitting all the way at the bottom then you could draw your pencil line now when you place that first stone back in so if I put in the plume agate and I see that the pencil line is way up high then you'll need to know you know that you need to cut more so that pencil line is just resting right above the silver wire that makes sense if you do happen to accidentally cut too much on the sides and have all that gapping, just shave off the little bit of the bottom on your wheel here or if you want to do it over the flat lap since those angled cuts on the side will help snug in that stone again. Then you can go ahead and rough out the dome on this piece too. And this is where you can start playing around with different heights of your inlay designs. And I know right now this Amazonite is a little bit taller than the agate. So you don't have to feel like it needs to all be the same height. It's just going to depend on what you have going on with your design. I know in one of my figurative pieces, I made the booty stones pop out a lot more than the other ones around it. So that, that one always tickles me <laughs> when I think about it. But anyways, the point is to add a little bit of your artistic twang to it. And here's a little close-up so you can see everything all dried up. As you can see, my cuts aren't perfectly perfect. I know I have some extremely minimal gapping going on in a few spots on that Amazonite piece, but no one's going to see it or even care once it's all epoxied in, I promise you. Now, while I think this looks nice with just these two stones here, I mean, you can keep it as this. I think this looks pretty legit too. We're actually going to go all out and add a little bit of sterling silver between those two stones there. Eventually, I just happened to find a little scrap of 20 gauge backplate that I'd sought out from another project. So I'd say use whatever you have on hand or whatever feels right for the project that you're working on. Now I'm marking how long I need it to be, and then I'll hand file it to make sure it has that snug fit but is recessed into the circular framework. Then I'll use my 3M wheel to clean up that top part. You could also go ahead and polish it as well, but you could do it later, either before or after you epoxy the stones. It just kind of depends on what stones you're using or if you don't want them to touch Zan. It's just kind of your preference at this point. Then lastly, I'm gonna go ahead and scuff up those side walls with my file here. That'll help kind of create a little bit more of a physical bond between the stone and the silver when we go to glue this in. So back at the stones, now I need to make room for that silver band. So I'm gonna cut a little bit from both the plume agate and the Amazonite until everything is sitting tightly and down into that framework. Now here you can see everything really starting to pull together now. From the side view though, I'm not so keen on those different heights. I think it would have worked fine if it was just stone to stone like it was before I added the silver, or maybe if the silver banding was higher, like maybe somewhere between half the distance between the two stone heights. Um, so not only is this not really visually appealing to me, it also is gonna make it really hard to clean that epoxy later since that is such a tight space there between those two stones that I'd have to clean. So I'm going to go ahead and bring that girdle line down and re-dome the Amazonite at 220 diamonds so it'll be the same height as the agate after all. Once I'm happy with the stone heights and all that jazz, I'll move on to the 280 resin wheel. I'll redraw my pencil line in case I happen to smudge it off, and I'll cut more of the stone down until that pencil line is gone now. Essentially, when you dry off the stone, you want the stones to be polished right to the edge of the silver framework. I don't want to go any lower or I might create more gapping between the stone and the silver. Another reason I leave that lower side and the bottom of the stones rough is that it gives the epoxy something to really grab onto when you go to glue these in later. Then at the 600 resin wheel, I'll redraw those pencil lines again so that I know where to polish up to. I don't tend to do that with my last few polishing stages since I know that my stones are hard enough that more material won't be removed at those stages, but you might have to do this pencil line trick again if you have a softer stone and need to be even more careful about overcutting. So we, now we're about ready to glue, but first I'd like to dry everything off and do one last test fit because sometimes things get a little weird when they're wet, so just double check it before you start mixing your epoxy. Because I just took my stones off the wheels, I'll want to warm them up on my candle warmer to remove all that moisture in the stone. Maybe about five minutes is fine for pieces like this. 
Um, now while those are cooking, I'll prep the silver by swabbing it clean with an alcohol soap Q-tip. Then I will use my X-Acto blade to score the inside and even up the inside edges, why not? Uh, to add a little extra grippiness for that epoxy since the silver is really slick in general, but then it's been through the tumbler, you just wanna have a little bit more of that physical bond there. Oh, and I also forgot to mention, make sure to clean the bottoms of your stones too, because you'll probably have some residue from both the CA glue and the rubber cement that you don't want getting in the way of your epoxy. If you've been around me long enough, you know that my go-to epoxy is epoxy 330, and I'm going to eyeball even amounts. So I make sure that the blob is the same size from the top, then I also look at the side to make sure the height is the same too, since that resin is actually a little bit thicker than the hardener, in my opinion, when I look at it. Um, then I'll add a little bit of my charcoal powder to make a light gray to help hide those gaps better and somewhat match the gray of the silver. Usually I use painter's tape to cover my silver design since there's truly nothing worse than trying to clean up all that dried epoxy over my whole design. Ask me how I know. <laughs> but I've never had to tape a circular piece like this before. Um, and it's kind of embarrassing that my own technique <laughs> really didn't work here. So I actually tried to fold over the tape on itself. Didn't work out quite like how I thought it would in my head. In retrospect, I would have done smaller pieces and then rubbed it down good with the top of what's left of my fingernails so that it would actually stick. But it didn't stick. Uh, it's all good though. I ended up cleaning it up easily afterwards. So it's fine. Now you'll also see me taping the agate here too. I usually don't do this, like I usually don't tape my stones, but this one had some druzy pockets that I didn't want glue into because I thought it would look like crap. So I'll just leave this on here until the epoxy thickens. Then before it hardens, I'll take that tape off so it doesn't get stuck there permanently. After mixing my epoxy, I'll wait until it has a thicker consistency before I start applying some into the bottom and also making sure to kind of pull some up along the inner corners and sides as well. I usually like adding enough so that when my stone is put in and pressed down, some of the glue shoots out the sides. To me, that's how I know that there aren't any air pockets under the stone because I didn't add enough epoxy. Then I will put my silver band in, pull up some glue on the, both sides of it so that the glue will be sandwiched between the stones and the silver. Then the stones can go in and be pressed down. You'll probably have glue bulge out from around the edges, so I usually take a tool. Usually I have um, both a sharpened and blunted X-Acto blade, so I use my blunted here to scrape up some of that excess for now. Then I set a timer anywhere between 10 and 20 minutes. Uh, timing will depend on room temperature, humidity, and all that good stuff until the glue is a little bit thicker but manageable to clean up than what it is right now. After waiting about those 15 minutes or so, I'll remove the tape so that it doesn't end up there permanently. So then I can use my X-Acto again to carefully remove those thicker sections of sticky glue. At this point, I'll dip a Q-tip in acetone, and then I'll either let it air dry for about 10 seconds or press it into a piece of cardboard to remove too much of that ex excess acetone because you don't want it, I don't know, I don't like it too drippy. But anyways, you'll rub off any of the extra glue from your silver framework, the stones, and that banding. You don't have to be completely thorough at removing all of the glue here, so you, um, you can do this again once the epoxy is cured, but mainly you want to remove those thicker sections of glue because that's going to be what's hard and time-consuming to remove um, later on. So I've let this whole thing cure for 24 hours. The next day, I'm going to do another round of acetone wiping. And I should note that this tiny bit of acetone isn't going to ruin your epoxy bonds in the design. It's not like you're soaking the whole piece for days on end, which I've actually done, and the glue was surprisingly still stubborn enough to hold on. But it will help lift those thin layers of epoxy that might be left over on your stone or your silver. Then I'll do a final polish of Zam on the silver sections, making sure not to overheat the silver and mess with the epoxy. But I will note that it takes an extreme amount of heat to mess with the epoxy, but we'll just be careful, right? And then uh, you could have done this before gluing the stones too, but when I do this, it actually helps point out if I still have epoxy stuck to the silver since it'll show up as like a little cloudy spot as you polish. Clean it up with Dawn, hot water, and a toothbrush, and you're done! <laughs> I hope this tutorial has been inspirational to help you realize all those inlay ideas you've had tucked away in your sketchbook but didn't quite know how to make. But simple projects like cobblestone pendants can easily lead you into making rings, cuffs, and more just using the basics here. 
So what do you think? Is this something you plan on trying out soon? Drop a note below if you have any comments or questions. Shoot me a small donation for my efforts using that link in the description below. And make sure you subscribe to my channel because I have inlaid bales and cups coming up very soon. But anywho, thanks for sticking with me today for this long tutorial. And happy cabin, y'all!